Twenty percent on the test, and you get into what scenario? No, we can't. Oh, it's ten questions. Yeah, no, it's actually. How did you do your math? I thought he was going to say eight plus. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> How's it going? It's going. It's going. You want some proofs? No, an algebraic. Not an actuarial proof. All right. That's not what we're doing in this class. I don't want to prove. A hoppy towel? All right, let's look at a couple of these problems of the ones that I handed out. They have to do with, the first few have to do with the gamma distribution, and then we're going to talk about the chi-square distribution a little bit more, and then we'll do some of those problems as well. I want to show you a couple of things on Excel. Chai. Chai. No, not chai. It's not a lot. It's not a latte. <laughs> it's not. It could just be regular. Could be regular tea. All right. What is the what does the PDF for the gamma distribution look like? Okay. X to the alpha minus one. Okay. Okay. We're in math class, not linguistics. What? He's explaining to me the meaning of chai. It's because of the tea. No. Not chai. Not chai, but chai. Chai means tea, so when you say chai tea, you're saying tea tea. T squared. All right. Uh, what was the mean of this distribution? Okay, and the variance. All right. So let's see if we can answer question one. Uh, let's do one. Uh, uh, it was exercise 6-58. I took it out of a different textbook. The other ones are problems out of your textbook, but uh, since you probably have, don't have your textbook with you, that was why I made copies of the problem. Hey, look at that. I anticipated that correctly. All right, let's do A, A, B, and D first, and then I'll show you how to do C on Excel. <clears throat> I'll tell you how it works. Yeah, 6 58. <laughs> so the first part asks you to find the parameter. It says beta. Just replace beta with beta. And that book that I took out uses beta instead of beta. Yeah. Don't miss it first. Ah! They could have used Ada. They could have used Ada. They could have used Zeta. They could have used a sailboat. They could have used a sailboat. They could have drew a happy face. A star. Or a Simpson. Pretzel. The thimble from the Monopoly game. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, absolutely. They could have used all sorts of things. All right. How are we going to figure out what alpha and theta are? <clears throat> And how'd you come up with alpha is five and theta is two? Mental math. Okay. He's good at the mental math. He says 10 equal to alpha, theta, then 20 equal to the alpha, theta squared. Okay. And then I just knew that theta had to be two and alpha had to be five. You do that. You could have solved it algebraically at that point. Right? They tell you that the mean is 10, the variance is 20. Like Marshall said, you could probably inspect pretty quickly to see what it had to be, right? When you go from alpha theta to alpha theta squared, you multiply by, well, you multiply this by theta, and this gets by 2, so theta has to be. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be two, doesn't it? Do you go from here to here, you multiply by theta, and then go from here to here, you multiply by two, so theta has to be two. And once theta is two, alpha has to be five. <laughs> What's that? In my part, I'm done this <laughs> You're done? I'm out. All right. If you didn't see it that quickly, of course, you could always just solve. All right. 
<clears throat> so that also gives you what B has to be. You would have f of x would be what? X, to, x is the variable, so it'd be x to the fourth. Okay. Okay. It would be careful. It would be four factorial, which is what? Good. Okay. Which is whatever two to the fifth is. It would be 32. That's a little bit too much for me. Uh, what's 32 and 24? Two to the fifth is 32, you multiply 32 times 24? 768. All right, so there would be your PDF, just simplifying. Remember that when alpha is an integer, gamma of alpha is alpha minus one factorial. So since alpha is five in this case, we would have four factorial, which is where the 24 came from. Okay. So that would be our PDF. I guess I'll come back to D in a minute, but we, or excuse me, come back to C in a minute. <clears throat> Pardon me. But for D, we want to find the expected value of 4x minus 5x squared. How would we attack this? Separate it. We're going to write it as 4 times expected value of x. Minus 5 times the expected value of x squared. I, mean, I would not want to try to compute this directly, right? If you were to do this by the definition, you would be doing, remember by the definition, you would do the integral over your support of the function times the PDF. That doesn't look like a lot of fun, does it? Yeah. No, not particularly, right? Okay. That would be the definition, wouldn't it, for doing it that way? That doesn't look like it's something I really want to do. Okay. I do? Yeah. I really don't. All right. What's going to go in for expected value of x here? 10. Good, because they tell us it's 10, right? What's going to go in for expected value of x squared? How did you get 100? Mm, we gotta be careful, right? Because it's not expected value of x quantity squared. How'd you get 10? Because it's, if the variance equals the expected value of x squared minus the mean, it'll be 30. Minus what? 120. There we go. Working on it. That's our formula, right? What pieces do we know from the formula? Variance. Variance is 20. We don't know expected value of x squared, but we do know, whoops, we do know expected value of x is 10, so we have 10 squared, so we get 120 here. You got there, yep. <laughs> So what do you have? 40 minus 600, so you'd have negative 540, or 560, I mean. I like that problem, Dr. Jerry. Not bad. Are we okay with that? Just using the different properties for the gamma distribution? Okay. All right, let's look at C. Let's see why I want to show you what a uh, little bit on Excel rather than doing this by hand. C asks for the probability that x is less than 6. <clears throat> Pardon me. Unfortunately, I don't have a nice CDF given to me for the gamma distribution, right? So if I want to calculate this probability, it's a continuous random variable. How am I going to calculate the probability that x is less than 6? What do we need to do? Yeah, we do the integral, right? It'll be the integral from... Zero to six of the PDF, right? Mm 
And we came up with a PDF in the previous, or one of the previous parts, right? All right, if you were going to do this by hand, what te technique of integration would you need to use? Uh, if you integration by parts, how many times did you have to do the integration by parts? Four. Four. <laughs> I had to do it one for each of the powers of x, right? <clears throat> because to be able to integrate that, I need to get rid of the four powers of x, so I need to integrate by parts four times. Not that it's horrible, horribly difficult, it's just a lot to keep track of. Because you've got to worry about sign changes and all those good things, right? So <clears throat> I would either use a calculator if I were going to do this, or I might as well show you a little bit on Excel. Because if you take, take the second semester, we'll be doing some things in Excel, right, Haley? Just a few. Just a few. <laughs> and it'll work better than numerical, so that's always a good thing. Sure. I'm 100% confident it'll work better than... <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. Oh, I'm 100%. It'll you can't be. Can't use 100% confidence. That's true. That's right. 99% confidence there. <clears throat> All right. So let's see if I can zoom in. The hardest part I had to remember with the uh, using Excel was remembering to zoom in so people could actually read the book. That was the hardest point that I, the hardest part that I had to do. All right. One of the nice things about Excel is that if you start typing the function name in, it'll. It usually tries to fill in what you're trying to type in, so you don't have to remember a lot of the names. <clears throat> One thing that you do have to remember when you're doing functions in Excel is make sure that if you want a function in Excel, you hit the equal sign first, so that Excel knows that a function's coming. If I just start typing the word gamma, it comes up with a whole list of things for gamma. A lot of these we won't be using. Okay. The gamma is just the gamma function. Okay, so literally the gamma of alpha, it'll return that for a value. So if you plug in a, if you put to a type in gamma of a number, it will come up. So just to show you from the last one, if we wanted to do gamma of five, that was in the last part, uh, one of the parts for the PDF, right? I should get 24, so I know how to do that. Okay. And of course, one of the points of the gamma function is that it extends the factorial. So if you wanted to do gamma of, say, one third, it'll give you a decimal approximation for it. That would be a value for one third factorial, decimal approximation of it. Oh, I'll, I'll you're right. It's um, if I want to do that would be a third of one third factorial. Sorry, or yeah, it would be a third of one third factorial, or three times one third factorial. Whatever way it is. Yeah, it would, be, it would be three times one-third factorial. Yeah, if I want to do one-third factorial, I would have to do a little bit of extra things. But I'm just saying the whole point of that was I don't have to put an integer in there for the make the gamma function work. I do have to put in something that's non-negative, but or actually I can't put in zero either. But anything that's positive will work, so it doesn't have to be an integer. That was my point. I had a point. <laughs> All right. Uh, we won't be using that a lot, but we will be using... Mostly for our purposes, we'll be using with the gamma dot dist, so the gamma distribution one. You might want to know the gamma dot i and v, the inverse. We'll be doing more of the inverse stuff later. Not necessarily for the gamma function, but that inverse one comes up in statistics quite a bit for different uh, distributions. But what we're really interested in right now is this gamma dot dist. So if I just go down there and hit the tab button, it pops the rest of the... You don't want to hit enter on that, by the way. It'll think that you're trying to enter something into a cell and you'll get a question mark name or whatever because it won't understand what you're doing. So you want to hit tab to get the actual function name to pop up. Notice this takes four arguments into the function. We want an x value. We want an alpha and a beta, or for us, remember again, the beta is the theta. Okay. So we want an alpha value, a theta value, 
And then whether or not we want to plug that X into the PDF or we want to plug that X into the CDF, going all the way up from zero up to a certain value. Okay, so that's what that last part is. So in this case, the X value that we were interested in in this problem, it says the probability that X is less than six. So the X value that we want is six. The alpha was five and the theta was two. So I'm just separate, and notice I'm separating these by commas, right? So the first thing is what the x value is that you're plugging into the distribution. The second thing is your alpha. The third thing is your theta. The last thing that you want to plug in is what's referred to as a Boolean variable. It just means it's true or false. If you put in true, the value that'll come out is the cumulative distribution function. If you put in false, it literally just takes the x value and plugs it into the PDF. Okay. So true is CDF, false is PDF. Which one do we want if we want to compute the integral? True. true. We want the cumulative one, right? So I can just start typing in the true, and it's fine. I don't have to worry about the capitalizing. And you get a value of about 0.184. So that gives you their probability. I don't know this because I don't play with it enough, but there's a good chance that the newer TI-84s have a gamma function built in. I don't know. I haven't done it. I'm just saying there's a good chance. If there's a probability menu, it might be in there. It's a popular enough function that it might be in there. I'm not going to swear to it. I don't actually know. <clears throat> Oh yeah, you could, I'm sure you can program it. But anyway, so this just shows you a little bit with Excel about how you can do this quickly. And if you're going to do things that are actually doing these types of distributions in practice, you're going to be using a numeric tool to help you. So Excel or SPSS or R or something else in some other statistics package you would be using. So anyway. Any questions on how I use that at all? It's not hard, you just have to remember the name of the function, right? Yeah. Let's look at the the uh, six dash sixty, the next one down, or not the next one down, but the one after it. I find this author's sense of humor amusing. He said, I find it amusing. <laughs> Hi, Grace. No problem, Michael. Yeah, all right, let's look at let's look at part A. It says you're trying to figure out if the three bag supply is going to be last for the two day weekend. Well, if you look at the first part, they tell you, you have a Poisson process, right? So how do we, how would we attack part A? What would we need to do? Let somebody else take care of your dog, perhaps. I don't know. What do we need to do? Um, determine the probability that uh, x is plus two. Okay. And what kind of a variable is x then in that case? Is it, is it Poisson? Is it exponential? Is it gamma? It's still discrete, right? Because you're trying to figure out the number of times the dog is going to go outside, right? So you need the probability that x is less than or equal to three. They give you a one day average but they want it for a two-day period, right? But for Poisson, how do we know, what do we need to do to adjust for a different period? You just multiply by the period, right? So if it's once per day, what's the lambda going to be for the Poisson variable we're interested in? Two, right? So if I go back here. So 
if x is for your two-day period, hello. Why are you doing that? Come on. It's weird. No, it's not working. I don't think you want it. Hmm? No, it's recognizing the pen because I'm hitting the click and it's good. This, the uh, other thing's popping up, but the pen's not coming up. It's just weird. Well, it's not letting me do anything with the pen. It's not like it, it's acting like it doesn't want to recognize the pen at all. Weird. This is bizarre. Why are you doing that? Have we got intermission music to play while I'm trying to figure out why the pen's not working? It says it's connected. Your pen has battery? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that worked. <laughs> It was the music. It was the music. All the music. There we go. That was bizarre. All right. So going back to this again. Oops. Because I minimize it. So we're going to let X be the business strips, number of business strips, I should say. That's what the, that's what the author called it. <laughs> In the two day period. Then, what did you say the lambda was? For one or two days? For two days. Two. two. Good. All right. And we want the probability that x is less than or equal to three. Right? So, with the Poisson, then, what's your PDF? Or PMF, I guess, technically, is the right word for it. Okay. Okay, so in this case it would be e to the minus 2, 2 to the x over x factorial. Right? Okay. So you would do the sum, you can write it that way, x equals 0 to 3 of e to the minus 2, 2 to the x over x factorial. If you're doing it by hand, you would need to write it out to do each piece. Um, you can do a sum command in your calculator, or if I can get this to recognize the pen after I'm done again, we can use Excel again. Am I going to have Excel on the test? If, there, if I want you to use Excel, you will have Excel on the test. <laughs> I will try not to. Notice that the Poisson distribution is also built into Excel. Wow. <laughs> All right, so what's the x value you think we want to plug in in this case? Three. Three? What was the mean of the distribution that we're worried about? Two. And then do we want it cumulative or not cumulative in this case? Cumulative because we're going up to three, right? So I want the true again. Because it was from zero up to three. So you get point eight five seven. So you would do false. Yep. Yep. Yeah. If you wanted it just at three, you would do the same type of thing to type in. You would just put the two and three. Sorry, I did the backwards. Three and two, and then say false. And that would give you the that would give you that it was exactly three. Yeah, that was exactly three, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. For the Poisson, now if you do that for a continuous distribution, all it's doing is plugging the number into the PDF. That's not a probability. To get probabilities for continuous distributions, you have to integrate, right? 
Okay, because we know the, if it's a continuous distribution, if you just you want the probability that's exactly equal to something, it's always zero. So. <clears throat> this okay? All right. Uh, what about part B, where it asks you to write the density function? Kind of yeah. What if we want to write the density function for part B? For what kind of a variable? What kind of variable is T? Oh, it's definitely a continuous random variable. Good. What's the distribution of T if we're waiting for the fourth occurrence of the Poisson process? Well, it would be it is, it, or the first occurrence it would be exponential. Gamma. It's a gamma, right? Because <clears throat> it's a fourth occurrence, right? Okay. So it was the waiting time until the fourth business trip. <laughs> so T is gamma. Why? The dog has to go to the bathroom. Why is that weird? I just think it's funny that it's called a business trip. <laughs> Dogs, yeah. Everybody poops, Michael. Okay, that's fine. You can take a shit. And like, I'm totally okay with that. Don't, like, don't, be, like, don't be laughing at it. I'm laughing and calling it a business trip. I think it's funny. I think it's funny. I think it's weird. You're weird. Every time I tell your dog, I have a business trip. Wait, <laughs> All right, so we said that T is a gamma distribution, so one of the notations that we'll use for different types of different uh, distributions is using these abbreviations. So we did, we've done uniform on intervals, we use U of something, right? Well, these two, for, uh, for the first and the second components, if, if you will, in here, we're going to write the alpha and the theta. So what's alpha in this case? Four? Because alpha is the number of occurrences, right? So the alpha is four. What's the theta? Yeah, I think it's going back to the original Poisson process in this case. So it's going to be one, right? In general, your theta is going to be your reciprocal of your lambda, correct? Just like it is for exponential. Remember your lambda counts number of uh, mean number of occurrences per unit time, where theta is time until first occurrence and the reciprocals of each other, right? If you expect three per hour, you would expect one every third of an hour, for example. Because it has two it has two parameters, an alpha and a theta. And alpha's first. And alpha's up third first if you write it in this notation, right? So why is alpha in this? So alpha is the number of times that you want, the number of successes that you want. Correct. And theta is the 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 it would be the mean waiting time for one occurrence. So it's one over. It's one over the one over the lambda, right? So yeah, for the, for your parameters here, this one's the alpha and this one's the theta. So what will your PDF look like then? X to the third. Okay. Plus e the negative x. Over one. Over one, good. Uh, and that, that T. Is that? You're putting that. Oh, you want me to put a T instead of an X because we called it T? Is that what oh, you're telling me? T is just two X over one. Okay. Say it again? So it's a, it says T is the gamma. Over yeah. One. Right. So we'll put that in. Well, that's, we're, the, we're using the gamma. Function, so that's the, the gamma part is just telling us what the form of the PDF is. The 4, 1 is where we're telling us what to put in for alpha and what to put in for theta. So if you want to call the variable t, that's fine. I was just using x because we typically use an x, but the look that variable doesn't name doesn't matter. It'd be 3 factorial, which is 6, and then it'd be 1 cubed, or not 1 cubed, 1 to the fourth. 
So that would be your PDF. We agree? And then the last part's asked for the probability that t is less than 2. What would you do to attack that if you were doing it by hand? Integrate it from 0 to 2. Integrate it from 0 to 2. This is part C. Yep. And then again, if you were doing this by hand, you'd have to use by parts, right? We agree? Or if we go back over to Excel, we can use our gamma distribution again. The x value here is 2. The alpha value was 4. Theta value 1. Cumulative or not? Yes. Okay. What's that? Yeah, I don't know if I'm doing it. <laughs> well, I'm guessing it's probably just as easy to put your calculator if all you have to do is plug it into the function. So this is trying to save us some more. Yeah. So it's the chances that it's not going to be yes is pretty small. So we get about 0. 0.143. It's okay. Not too bad. Decent. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the chi-squared distribution. Um, I may have to log in another computer because I didn't bring it up. Didn't bring a document camera. So this won't be this part. Well, it'll still record my voice, but it's not going to actually record the screen. I can turn it on, but it's not connected to the computer that I'm recording. I'd have to dig under there to try to figure out where it's connected in, and then pull it out and then put it back in when I'm done, and I'm not doing that. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so the, the chi-squared the, the chi distribution, remember again, is, is a special case of the gamma distribution where we have the theta value is equal to 2, right? And the... R, excuse me, the alpha value is R over two. I'm trying. I'm, I'm having a hard time talking because I'm trying to figure out where the where to click for the document camera. Sorry. All right. I mentioned this before. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll see why in a couple of days why we care so much about the chi-squared distribution. But it pops up enough that they have a table of values rather than having to calculate things all the time. So at the top of the screen, we have, we have a picture of what the PDF looks like. So ignore the integral part here at the beginning. This is your PDF, right? The alpha is r over 2. The theta value is 2. What's this w? Hmm? Sorry. Okay. Okay. Where are you looking at? Yeah. Oh, this W? Yeah. yeah, it's just the X. Yeah. <clears throat> it's because they're using X as a CDF value and they've got the, the variable up in the up in the upper limit of the integral. Alright, so this is a graph of the PDF. This is uh, like I said, this is just a special case of alpha. We graphed some alphas last time. Or not some alphas. We graphed some gamma distributions last time with different values of alpha and theta. Right? So again, this particular one goes up and then where's that flashing? Goes up, comes back down again. Uh, so we've got this tail that <clears throat> gets smaller on the end. And on this side, it's pretty small as we get closer and closer to zero. <clears throat> All right, so what they've done in this table is that they've calculated probabilities of being on what's called the left tail or the right tail. 
and figuring out where the, what the x value has to be to cut at the, those probabilities. So what we mean here is, the pictures aren't great for what it means, but just to explain it. So let's look at this one right here, this 0.975. So what this 0.975 means is that if we have a R value of say two, then at this X value, the points as a 7.378, that would be the probability that you're at that value or less. So these are all CDF values. So it's the X value that you would need to plug in to get 97.5% to be below that value. So another way to think about it is the it's percentiles. That would be the 97 and a half percentile. Okay. Same idea down here. If you look at say 0 0.025, and then say maybe we do eight degrees of freedom. This is called degrees of freedom. If we do the R is equal to eight at 0 0.025, then you would have 2.18. I'm reading it right. So that would be the two and a half percentile. Okay. But we're going to be interested in this later on with statistical stuff is interested in how likely it is for a particular value to pop up. So if you had a, for eight degrees of freedom, it's not very likely to have a value being less than 2.18 because only two and a half percent of all values are less than 2.18. So that's a very unlikely thing to have happen. Right? Up here, <clears throat> if we look at this one, it would be unlikely for a value to pop up that's above 7.378, right? Because only 2.5% or higher. Yeah, Can you just say one more time, the whole table of the numbers, that's the x value that you would input? Is that's the x value that you would input into the CDF to get these probabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can actually see that from Excel again. Let me switch back over here. So are those the Oops. most common percentiles? Those are, yeah, they're the most common ones. And the, the reason for that is from hypothesis testing stuff that we'll do next semester. That's one that you'll, we'll talk about why those are the popular ones. So we can see this in Excel again. If I start typing in chi-square, chi notice again we get a nice list, right? <clears throat> Now notice in the previous problems that we were doing, <coughs> pardon me, gosh. In the previous problems that we were doing, we were trying to figure out a probability, right? We put in an X and get out a probability. That was why we used the distribution function for the gamma and for the Poisson. In this case, we're given a probability, we want an X value. We're doing the inverse process, right? So you can do that on Excel as well. Notice there's two different inverse functions. I'll tell you how each of them work. Okay. So the first one, the chi-square inverse, just takes in two inputs. You want the probability and the degrees of freedom. What this is doing, basically this is the way the table is set up. You type in the probability and the number of degrees of freedom that you have, it'll spit out the x value that you want. So remember the first example goal I said was looking at the table. Go back to the, I'll go back over to the table here real quick. Going back over to the table, I said this was the probability, the 0.975, and the degrees of freedom was 2. Right? So the x value that comes out should be the 7.378. Right? Okay? So if I go back over to Excel, the probability is 0.975, and the degrees of freedom was 2, I better get 7.378 or I'm telling you a whole bunch of wrong information. Okay? Well, it's, it's not. It's 77759. That's a little awkward. Not if I round a 3 half before. Of course I was going to round. Okay. So this will give you your x value. So basically it's got this table plus a heck of a lot more built into it. 
because I can use that chi-square inverse button, or function, I mean. So do the same thing for the other one. The other one I said was what? I said we wanted a 0 0.025 probability and eight degrees of freedom, and it came up with 2.18. Now, it won't be exactly 2.18, Michael. There will be some rounding. <laughs> so I get those values. That makes sense, Michael. You okay, Michael, with that? No? <laughs> so what's the difference between the two investors? The other one that says the RT. I haven't done that one yet. I'm going to mention that. Oh, okay. I yeah. They were I know. All right. So, going back over to the table, when it says the, that one that said dot RT on it, the RT stands for right tail. There's a right tail and a left tail. So, just from the picture standpoint, I mean, it's a big tail, but this would be the left tail because you're going from X value and down, right? Right tail is going from X value and up. So, if it wants the right tail, it wants, the, it wants the probability that you're greater than that value rather than less. That's all the right tail means. Okay. Notice, and it's probably hard to see, so let me zoom in a little bit more. And maybe focus. Are you going to focus? Nope. Just well, is that better? <laughs> no, still not focused, so it didn't work. <laughs> oh, it did work. Wonderful. All right. Oh, well, we had to say something anyway. All right, anyway, notice we've got the probability here. <laughs> the probability is here, and the uh, subscript here is 1 minus that. So the probability here, being this would be your left tail probability. These subscripts are your right tail probabilities. There's a reason why that we'll discuss next semester why those are the way they are. Why these are complements of each other. That's really bad now. These are complements of each other. So if I want to use Excel to figure out that right tail value, flip back over. All right, so go over to the right tail. Notice again it says probability and degrees of freedom. I'm going to get this same exact number here by using 0 0.025 for the probability. Right? We got the 7.378 by using 0.975 of the probability. If I want the right tail, I'll use the complement of that probability. So we'll do 0 .0, uh, 0 0.025 and then two degrees of freedom and I get the same value. Magical. Magical. When we're doing hypothesis testing things next semester, we typically are worried about being above a certain value. Thing the chi squared distribution is tied to variances. So if we want to know if something in particular where you typically worry about if variances are equal or not, or are we looking at things where it's bigger than a particular value rather than in between two values or less than a particular value? Is this okay? So if I want to do one of these problems. I know Ashlyn's packing up. Ashlyn already said she had to leave early today. So, bye, Ashlyn. Bye. Bye. If I wanted to look at say um, three point five dash nine, just real quick, and do one of these problems, let's look at parts. Let's look at let's look at parts A, B, and C. All right. So part A has the probability that X is less than 7.564, where our X is chi-square of 17. This fancy looking X thing is just the Greek chi. So chi-square of 17 is the notation. So what's inside the parentheses is telling you what the R value is, that degrees of freedom. <coughs> Pardon me. We could set it up with an integral, but I don't really care to do it with an integral. There's a couple of different ways we could attack it. One of the reasons why it's got these numbers in it 
is to give you a way to look at the table and do it. So just to tell you how we would do it from the table, and then we can do it in Excel as well. All right, so going back over here, and maybe it'll focus again. Why it really hates focusing, doesn't it? Is <laughs> Is it better one or two? <laughs> Yeah, that's what that says. That's not what I wanted to look at. That's where I was just trying to get. My, I put my glasses on there, thinking it might focus on my glasses. Let's make it look a little bit better. Nope, that didn't work. That would have been really funny if it just did. So yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, so this problem, tell, if you can kind of read it, in this problem it tells you there were 17 degrees of freedom. So this is the 17 degrees of freedom row. Do you see it? Can you squint and see the 7.564 number? Yes. Yeah, it's right there, right? So if I sc scroll, that was in the second column. So the probability that it's less than that value is what? 0 0.025, right? All right. So this would be, oops, that should be a decimal point, 0 0.025, right? Just to show you really quickly how we could do this on Excel. Oh, yeah, I would give you the table, absolutely. It's, it's the table in the back of the book. It's on page 583 of your book. All right. If I want to do this with Excel, the X value is 7.564. And then it asks for degrees of freedom, which is 17. And then again, we wanted cumulative. And we get just about 0.025, which is what we said from the table, right? Rounding error again, Michael, just so you're paying attention. Okay. <laughs> What would I need to do for the part B, do you think? There's two ways that you could attack it. You could, you could do the right tail distribution, right? Because right, right tail goes above the particular value, so you can use the right tail value. Or you could do 1 minus the regular distribution and do the complement. Right? So you could use... Right tail, that will give you above the value, or you can still use the left tail one and just do one minus. Either one will work. Okay. What about part C? What do you think you could do? Good, yeah. For part C, I could do the I could do the left tail. I could do the left tail for the less than 2759. And then subtract off the left tail for the the six point oh uh, the six point four oh eight. Right? So just to type it in for part C, we would do the chi-squared distribution, 27.59 is your x value, there's 17 degrees of freedom and we would want true again, and then I would subtract off your chi-squared distribution, uh, 6.408, 17 degrees of freedom and true again. Oops. Comma. I did forget a comma. I hit the decimal point instead. Thank you. There we go. And you get about 0.94. Wow. All right. Since everybody's so anxious to leave. Have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs>